Hi everyone. So I'm Rebecca from Begans. For those of you who, who don't know me, I'm the admin and comms officer. And you might have uh, received a marketing kit from me last week about Botanic Gardens Day this year. I'm just going to share my screen and just give you a quick update on what we're planning this year and hope to get um, some feedback from you guys. Um, so this is, can you all see my screen? Not that I can see you, so I don't know why I'm asking. But anyway, <laughs> fingers up, thumbs up or whatever. OK, all right. Um, sorry, Neil, you just saw this in the previous meeting. Um, so the theme this year is inspirational plants and people. Um, the whole of May, we're going to be promoting um, all the fantastic things that you guys do. We all do in botanic gardens um, and especially the conservation aspect of botanic gardens. Um, one of the major features we're having again is the Began Seesaw Plant Challenge. Uh, where people are encouraged to take a little video of themselves talking about their favourite or their inspirational plant, because this year the theme is inspirational plants and people. Um, we've got some sea soul prizes again, as you can see up there. Um, so if you're from a regional botanic garden, you may um, be, you may be able to win a year's supply of sea soul, which might be pretty handy. Um, we're going to be holding live webinars again, hosted by Costa Giordiadis from. Um, ABC's Gardening Australia every Thursday evening in May at seven o'clock um, Sydney time. Let me just turn my phone off and um, we're going to be having hopefully two professional development um, workshops, one held by BCAM and one held by BGEN, the Education Network, Botanic uh, Beganza's Education Network. And then on the actual Botanic Gardens Day, which is the last Sunday in May, which is the 28th this year, I've had some feedback from various gardens uh, saying they're going to be hold. Hello? No. Saying they're going to be able to um, hold events. If any of you have events planned, if you could email them to me, that'd be great because then we'll promote them through our social media channels and try and get as many people through your gardens as possible. Um, we're hoping that the community radio station 3CR in Melbourne will again have their uh, live gardening show on a Sunday morning dedicated to Botanic Gardens Day. Last year they had a panel of uh, Botanic Gardens staff including John Arnott and Tim Ubergang. I can't remember who else, maybe Tex was there. Um, and Costa rang in, he was at Glad at um, Cairns Botanic Garden, he rang in and, and um, really promoted botanic gardens um so we just the asterisk there is to remind me that we're going to confirm that um Mackay regional botanic gardens they have their 20th anniversary on the saturday so cost is actually going to be there in their garden on the saturday um we're not sure yet where he's going to be on sunday we will keep you in the loop and yeah please try and encourage everybody anybody can enter the plant challenge um the public are encouraged to enter. They may win a $50 sea soul hamper. I've sent out information on how to do the recordings. Any questions, any problems, just let me know. I'll put my email in the chat or you can ask Sheree. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, we'll just get straight into it. Um, I'll introduce you to Peter Symes. He's the curator at Cooktown Botanic Gardens, and he's just going to be um, yeah telling us about his garden and what makes it unique. So over to you, Peter. Thanks, Sheree. Just bear with me while I share screen and hope all this works. Um, can everyone see that? Just give me a thumbs up, Sheree, if that's working. Can you see that? Yeah, I can yep, see Pete. Yep, sounds good. Yep, okay, good. good. Thank you. Okay, I'll get started. Um, just let me drag some things out of the way so I can actually see. Uh, so look, um, thanks everyone for giving me time. I have to try and whip through this um, best I can. I've got 20 minutes. So um, look, the, you might be intrigued by the title, and I think it's a good thing to think about. You know, it's not the size oh, of the title. This is the cooktail one. In the dog. That's Peter, and he, he's speaking. And Can you really, move your um, microphone, please? And really, um, what I would like you to do is reflect in all your gardens. Uh, 
Mm. Are you doing the best? You know, are we doing the best we can with what we have and where we can? It's not about the size of our garden, all the resources I have. It's whether we're doing the very best with what we can do. So, so I'd like to just sort of present the Cooktown Botanic Garden as a bit of a case study, what a small, poorly resourced botanic garden in a very remote location of Australia um, can achieve and make its mark. My other sort of secret agenda is to entice you to visit. So I just want to acknowledge the traditional owners um, and recognise their continuing connection to land, water and communities. And we pay our respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures and to elders past, present and emerging. This is very pertinent for us up here where um, we're very much at that sort of frontier of where these people have um, lived for over 60,000 years. So where is like Cooktown? Um, when you look at that blue dot on that map, it, you know, it doesn't look much. It uh, looks really close to Cairns. Just to give you some perspective, um, we're 330 kilometres from Cairns by road, um, basically four hours drive if you're lucky and the floods haven't cut the roads. Um, we're over 2,000 kilometres to Brisbane and we're actually closer to Port Moresby, New Guinea, um, 700 kilometres away. So it's actually closer to go to another country than to go to Brisbane. Cookshire Council, um, it's actually the largest um, local government area in Queensland with over 100,000 square kilometres. So to put that in context, it's roughly half, a bit under half the size of Victoria. Um, Cookshire Council covers 80% of Cape York Peninsula. And across this very remote location, um, Cookshire Council is only servicing about 4,600 people, with about 2,600 in Cooktown itself. So I hope that gives you some picture of the remoteness and the large area of land in which this garden sits. Just bear with me with the history. Um, this is sort of a, a bit of a potted history. I won't go for every single one, but obviously one of the significant events from a botanical perspective is when James Cook careened the Endeavour on the Endeavour River and Joseph Banks, Daniel Solanda, Sidney Parkinson and Alexander Buchan basically had the time of their life collecting 400 plant specimens in seven weeks. So um, that was a, a significant event for the gardens here. And then probably the other really significant event, and this has influenced the development of botanic gardens elsewhere, was the discovery of gold. So in 1873, Cooktown was actually the, the major port for Queensland. And during that time, there was over that time of the gold fields over three years, there was 15,000 Europeans and 20,000 Chinese making their way to Cooktown to the Palmer gold fields. Um, later on, um, probably the other sad part of the gardens is that it was actually closed in 1917. Um, there was a sort of there was post First World War, you know, depressions and lack of money. So the gardens actually closed for 60 years until the 1980s when the council restored the garden um, to actually open it for an event. It was a jazz festival or something like that. And, and there on it sort of made it, it started to progress. Um, following that, the, the main significant, I suppose, events were a master plan being documented for the garden in 2018. And then in 2020, this before I arrived here, there was a significant investment of money in upgrades, mostly structural improvements to paths, um, signage, but also development of the First Peoples Grove, um, which was sort of like an, an additional collection to the gardens, if you like. Um, I don't know if you can see these maps very well, or I can scroll around, but um, this is sort of where the Botanic Gardens is. And um, there was Chinese market gardens occupying the site. So this is sort of post the gold period, but basically where the gardens is basically built, being built over part of a market garden. So there was a lot of sort of vegetable growing in the area, but these are some of the, the early, I suppose, um, context for the gardens. Uh, what did it look like? This is my best attempt at trying to find the same perspective of where these people and all their finery in 1890, we're dressing up and coming to the gardens. There's actually quite poor documentation for the gardens in terms of old photographs. There's only a handful of photographs and not much um, in writing in terms of uh, what happened here. 
it appears a lot of documentation might have been burned in council fires, but it, there is actually a real lack of dearth of, of historical info. In terms of our um, fire geographical regions or where we sit um, when you're looking at, I suppose, sourcing plants and conservation activities, um, Cape York Peninsula is quite a large, um, large biogeographic region, but we tend to sit within this starky coastal lowland, which um, sort of fringes the coast. I should actually I should go back there and just point out that this Cape York um, um, Peninsula biogeographic region actually extends the islands just off New Guinea cut the coast, so you know, we can go and collect and throw a stone and hit New Guinea, basically, um, which makes it pretty exciting. So in terms of where the garden sits, um, the Gallup Botanic Reserve, which was set aside you know, very early on around that 1878 period, you can see it's the bulk of the area with the botanic gardens, that little sort of corner to the left. Um, that plant you see there, Cocum australasica, that is actually currently flowering and growing in the reserve. So we have some of these real show-stopping plants um, that we can find just growing naturally. Uh, what does that look like from a drone perspective? Uh, the left-hand picture is basically the Gallup Botanic Reserve looking to the north. Um, that big rock in the lower left corner is the Finch Bay Lookout, which you'll get another perspective on later. You can just see some people standing there. It gives you an idea of the size of some of the granite. And the picture in the top right is um, looking towards Wayamburra Mount Cook, and you can see the cricket oval. So we're, I think we're the only botanic garden in the world that actually has a cricket oval um, as part of our part of our maintenance. And so it just gives you an idea of some of the um, the context in which the gardens are set. I'm just bringing it a bit closer to show you the the Cooktown, I suppose the cultivated part of what we look after a bit more closely. You can see it's quite a complex design, quite busy. Um, Cricket Oval takes up a fairly big space, uh, but I'll come to the statistics a bit more. I'm just trying to keep it snappy. So in terms of a bit more detail, the Gallup Botanic, you know, see that view on the left? We have to look after this. You know, we've got to walk along here and maintain this trail and have views like this every day. It's just pretty stunning, um, Cherry Tree Bay. So the Gallup Botanic Reserve, 62 hectares, uh, the dominant uh, regional ecosystems are eucalypt, open forest and woodland. And then you have Maluka open forest developing on the swampier lowlands. But just to point out that we have literal rainforest, which is coastal rainforest growing along the, the, the basically along the coast in places. And that there's actually copious rainforest plants occurring through this reserve um, and also through Cooktown. And if you drive around Cooktown, you'll see quite, you know, gallery forest basically um, growing along streams. And if you got clamber up on the Mount Cook, which I recommend if you ever come up here, uh, it's basically like cloud forest on top. So I've basically got um, fully fledged rainforest two kilometres away from the gardens. But there's rainforest plants mixed in through all these vegetation types. Cooktown Botanic Gardens itself, um, six hectares roughly. And in that, we've got about 800 or so taxa um, that sit within that garden. Um, but I won't give you accessions of plants because I think they're quite, well, the accessions are a bit over a thousand, but the number of plants, I think, are clearly more than what, what's listed. So it yeah, not, doesn't sound like super high diversity. It's a little bit under the diversity of Mel the, the Botanic Gardens of Melbourne. So it's not poor, but not high. In terms of our climate, um, very different to what a lot of a lot of you will experience. Tropical savanna climate basically means we have a very pronounced dry season, um, which you can see uh, if you look at the the bar graph there, you can see uh, very low periods of rainfall here. Basically means we've got to irrigate um, to keep the assets looking good, and we have to basically apply the same sort of irrigation that actually Melbourne Gardens would apply in their whole year over this period. Very dry, very warm, and very windy in Cooktown. Um, most of you won't have a mean angle temperature of 26 degrees, so pretty high temperature. Most of the rainfall is from basically January to March, and uh, it's not unheard of to get 200 millimetres or so overnight. So it can be very 
uh, extreme. Uh, we get down to a very freezing temperature of 18 degrees, mean minimum in July, and um, but basically you, you rare to put a jump or anything on like that. Soils, um, if you're picking a place uh, with great soils to build a botanic garden, it wouldn't be here. Um, all our soils are granitic, um, extremely acid, and very infertile typically. Um, the, 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 the pictures to the right are showing you most of the most of the nutrients are in the negative for, for basically if you wanted to produce crops. And the little graph on the left is our one and only soil test I think it's ever been done. It's been done since I've been here, which basically mirrors that that infertility. So the vegetation, natural vegetation largely is adapted to this, but when we're growing a lot of uh, wetter rainforest plants from more fertile soils, we do need to consider um, soil amendment or amelioration. So, what about what about Cooktown Botanic Gardens itself? What makes it what makes it special? Apart from that stunning view on the right, and there's that team I had at the time. That's that's the environment in which they work on. That's Finch's Bay Lookout in the reserve. Um, I, I think the things that stand this garden apart is its heritage legacy. It was established very early on in the in the in the formation of Cooktown itself. Um, we have very unique natural values because we're sitting within a botanic reserve, so we have natural vegetation um, to manage, uh, which is not unique to other gardens, but how many gardens have coral sea frontage on their boundary? Our boundary runs along the coral sea. Uh, I think that makes it fairly unique. The other thing that makes it, I think, probably uh, almost the most unique is it's one of the strongest um, connections in Australia to that botanical legacy of Banks, Joseph Banks and Daniel Solander. So when they were here for seven weeks, they collected almost 400 species of plants. And just to put that in perspective, that was over double what was collected at Botany Bay in Sydney. And they were here for seven weeks. So in terms of its um, European botanical connection, where we sit, you know, we sit right next to where plants were picked up in 1770. So that makes it pretty unique. The other thing, and any of my Queensland colleagues will probably get a bit grumpy with me, but um, you know, we're climbing the northernmost Queensland Botanic Garden. We're right up the very top, um, and we're the second northernmost in Australia after Darwin. So we have a we have, that probably comes with a lot of responsibility because there's no other botanic garden who's so closely connected to Cape York Peninsula. So we you know we have we have to do our best to influence what happens to to um, threatened species in that environment. And so I suppose I'm making the claim that we are a, a botanical gateway to that plant biodiversity that you find in Cape York. Um, basically, caring, managing and care for collections, that's what everyone does. Um, these are, are sub, basically our major collections, which I'll go to in a bit more length. So um, just to give you some diagramic represent what they look like, um, Banks and Solander, that's the Banks and Solander sort of um, concentration. And then Vera Scarf Johnson on the right, who was an early environmentalist in Cooktown and botanist and painter. And those collections are basically um, incorporating Cape York Peninsula flora. But we also have these 19th century heritage plantings, which um, we're responsible, the Botanic Gardens Heritage listed. So we have a responsibility to maintain these exotic plantings. And that's a, a big thread, I suppose, for the gardens. Rare Threatened species are found throughout the site. We don't have a specific collection, but they're certainly found within the gardens. And then we have the um, First People's Grove, uh, which is the most more recent development. And essentially, that's a cultural co collection really trying to showcase the, um, how these plants were used by the Gugu Yimadir. Um, how do they use the plants? You know, and there's plenty of interpretation and labels, which I, I should have probably thrown a label on here which has pictographs showing the types of uses of these plants. Um, landscape management is an ongoing thing. It's not only uh, horticultural curation, it's building things like erosion um, control. We, we do are subject to a lot of erosive forces coming off the slope. So there's a lot of often repair after uh, heavy rainfall events and 
a lot of our work seems to revolve around managing that erosion or building, I suppose, um, preventative <laughs> mechanisms to stop um, soil washing away, apart from you know, tree work and other things. Um, the other big part of our job is really uh, the Gallup Botanic Reserve. We have over three kilometres of walking trails to maintain. And apart from you know blowing leaves, which you might find a bit surprising when you're in nature going on blowing three kilometres of walking track, it's about removing hangers, dead branches, and environmental weed control. We also have interpretation up on this trail. And last year we actually put some plant labels along for people to connect to the botanical side of things. But one of our big enemies here is Falcateria falcata. Um, it actually occurs naturally not that far away, really, from Cooktown. Malacan albizia, um, very quick growing. It can grow up and shade out understory. Um, it suckers like mad. Um, it's just a real headache. I, I can't say how much area we have, but as a guess, based on what we did last year, it's probably over a hectare of, of ground that we have to try and control this weed. And so we have that. I suppose biodiversity responsibility to manage these environmental weeds. And that's, we're on steep terrain, rocky, you can slip over easily. Um, it's not an easy job. Um, you're basically sweat soaked all day long if you're doing any of this sort of work. Quickly into plant conservation. Um, so, just as a showcase, I want to talk about um, me and Macodia vicarii. Uh, there's, there's 200 roughly about 200 threatened plants in Cookshire Council. And this is one I wanted to just showcase um, some of the work that we've been doing. Um, you can see where it occurs in that pink shaded area. So we're at the sort of northern part of its um, range, which makes it important for us to actually look at conservation here because we've got the northern, you know, northern provinces of the species. Um, so I should just mention it's has a unique relationship with the Apollo jewel butterfly. So caterpillars live in this swollen cortex, along with the golden ant, which actually um, brings in nutrition into the plant by insects that it feeds on. And so ant plants have this, these modified chambers to actually absorb nutrition from the ant plant, from the ant, the golden ant, sorry, and they also help reduce predators on the leaves. So the main symbiotic relationship is with the ants. But the Apollo jewel butterfly also makes its home in this arrangement. Um, just showing you a picture of some of our seed propagation. On the far right, you can see a seed germinating. Grow them on very porous media. There's Julie there with the harvest of fruits, very sticky. Um, the plant is also um, uh, transported by the mistletoe, uh, mistle, um, a mistletoe bird, which actually helps transmit these sticky seeds. Um, there's a picture showing you the seedlings coming up. And on the right, you've got our nursery collection of ant plants, which is about 200 plus established species. This was all part of a, a relocation project um, where Cook Shire was involved in some land clearing or releasing land for estate. We've got another 300 established plants that have been placed up in trees. So we've basically got a collection of over 500 mature plants. And because it's done under permit, we have a responsibility to try and maintain this population and increase it if we can. Just quickly, um, partners that we're working with, um, I've been really supported by the Australian Tropical Herbarium and Mosman Botanic Gardens, Cairns Botanic Gardens, and the Tropical Botanic Gardens and Herbaria Forum, which comprises this group basically you can see there. So that's some of the um, collaboration work we're doing with a focus on threatened species. International partnerships still involved in the Climate Change Alliance, of course, and you know, still working with Tessa, I think, sitting in there. Um, we, you know, we're working internationally as a botanic guard in our small little patch. Climate change, I'm trying to whip through this. Sorry, sorry, guys, I'm running a bit late. Um, but we have the same issues as any other botanic garden, climate change. Probably the things of more concern is tropical cyclones that are projected to become more intense and they can be a garden wrecker, like they can destroy your garden. So that's a real risk for us. Uh, rain, you know, temperatures rising, summer and autumn rainfall change is not clear, but evapotranspiration is projected to increase from two to three millimetres a day um, by 2090. And to put that in context, that's like two or three extra litres per square metre that we need to find 
to manage this garden. I did some climate change assessment. Um, one of the interesting things is tropical species are not well known um, in terms of their risk. And, but when you do the climate risk assessment for our trees and our gardens, we get a lot of red dots, unfortunately. And the reason for that is that tropical species are pretty much growing at the warmest temperature that you can find on the planet. We don't have the precedent of knowing where these species can grow because there's no other warmer temperatures. But it's quite alarming when you start to look at some of the literature. Um, tropical species, you know, they're reaching their, their upper germination limits. Um, potentially, you know, that has a real, that's a real issue for species in, in the natural environment. They can't germinate, they can't recruit, and then we, then we lose species. Um, there's been observations of tree mortality accelerating in some of the moist tropics, and that seems to be linked back to increasing evaporative demand. Species just can't cope, um, so there's increased tree mortality already being observed. And then when you have climate extremes, um, either very wet, dry events, sea level rise, and um, extensive droughts, and some of these haven't been observed for the last 200 years or so, then we're seeing mortality in mangroves and tropical savannas. Um, I'm almost done. I'm trying to whip through this. Uh, one of our main sort of areas of focus is the front precinct area of the gardens. It's pretty much sign city when you walk in and really doesn't um, have a presence to say that this is a botanical garden, apart from that brown sign. And uh, we want to really um, try and build on the Cape York flora, so we have our orientation garden try and actually incorporate a lot more Cape York species and create a bit of a presence. So where are we going? Um, I've whipped through all this, but essentially, you know, continuing on that community interest and building partnerships, um, having a greater, um, I suppose, presence in plant conservation, adapting to climate change, because basically we all have to, and we face just as serious risks as temperate climates or anyone else, possibly even higher risks, because uh, botanic gardens generally are not well represented in tropical regions, full stop. Um, improving irrigation management and security of water supply. Um, we have very antiquated systems here and considerable labour is spent in the dry season um, looking after the assets. And then looking to our landscape development because in 2028, these gardens will be 150 years old and um, a master plan review is due then. So, from project perspective, we're really at the moment we're looking at um, uh, trying to obtain funding for some irrigation improvements, which releases a whole lot of other values for us, but also trying to find um, develop an iconic area to celebrate that 150 years. I'm done. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Sorry, my computer's a little bit slow getting started. Um, if there are any questions, you can just pop your, hat, uh, your hand up if you like to ask a question, or I'll just have a quick look through the chat and make sure I haven't missed anything. Um, Peter, I was just wondering with your nursery, do you grow, so do you grow the, a lot of the conservation plants or do you, how do you go about that? Do people bring them in or do you go out and collect them in the field or? Uh, good question. So we've got the ant plants, which are um, we, we're continuing to, continuing to propagate those. And you know, at the moment, we're trying to find ways of getting them out on trees, which is a, a challenging exercise to um, establish them. We we do have some species linked to myrtle rust conservation. So Brandon Espy at Townsville Botanic Gardens has sent us some species here. Uh, part of that is is some backup material, but also just observe whether they're um, seriously infected in this environment. Because we're in the dry tropics, we may be actually grow these species a bit more easily than other botanic gardens. Um, the yeah, other rare and threatened species, we haven't really moved into that space yet. But that tropical forum I mentioned to you, it's 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 basically driven by the threatened species department in the um, Department of Environment Queensland, and that's really looking at how we all network our activity. So, yeah, we're seen to have a role because of our unique environment and context of where we are, and I would expect over 
you know, next several years and some of those plants will start to see those here. Um, even if it just, um, just sort of ex situ conservation, a bit of backup, you know, species that can't be seed banked or protected in another way, but also just for observational uh, conservation in the sense of, you know, what diseases, how do they cope in that warmer climate, those sorts of things. So I'm pretty keen to develop that area and uh, one of my focus foci, I suppose you could say, is is really trying to ensure there's a scientific thread to these gardens and, and making sure the community knows about it. When they actually have a scientific treasure here, and councils, as you know, don't always understand the scientific element of gardens, and we have the same challenge here. You know, it's not just a park, um, and in the history, you know, the white history of Australia, if I can say that, it's actually quite significant from a botanical perspective. So. Um, they're the things I sort of argue. Yeah, yeah. Um, thanks, Peter. Thank, thanks very much for presenting today. That was, um, yeah, it was fantastic. Um, I'll hand over to Kelly now, um, curator of Geelong Botanic Garden, to do her presentation. Um, sorry, her computer's just. We're having a technical <laughs> difficulties up in the main office here at Geelong. Um, hello. Yes, I'm the new curator of Geelong Botanic Gardens, and I've noticed in a bit of the chat. Um, people doing acknowledgement of country, which I'd like to do. I'm I'm really fortunate to live and work on Waterong um, country, and I'd like to start by acknowledging that and pay my respects to the Waterong people as traditional owners of the land, waterways, and sky. Um, so technically, my position here is um, coordinator of Geelong Botanic Gardens, and I'm responsible for the strategic planning and operational delivery, um, and for the effective operation of the gardens as a key uh, recreational horticultural research education cultural and tourist asset for the city of greater geelong so we're really fortunate here to have a, a strong backing with the local council um, and a lot of resources uh, available uh, to us here um, i suppose a little bit of history i've i've just spent 19 years at zoos victoria uh, Originally, I was an apprentice here many moons ago um, and then moved on after a bit of travel around the world. And I've had an amazing journey looking at horticulture from a, a different perspective. Um, some may say second place uh, behind the animals and the conservation, but I've been lucky enough to work at Zoo Victoria long enough to, to follow their journey and to follow how even a zoo-based conservation organisation can change um, and ab absorb some of that floristic element as well not just uh, for the animals uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it and it was bittersweet leaving but ultimately I think my heart really belongs to the plants uh, hence why I've taken uh, the opportunity to come here to Geelong and back to Geelong um, and that's it I, I love plants I think plants um, absolutely supersede animals in every way shape or form there is so much variety and diversity and that's something that I really appreciate um, uh, and my aim here is really to give people a context in which where they place uh, the non-living human, uh, the living non-human world around them, um, but something else that we immerse ourselves in. I think I got that from Zoo Victoria about immersing ourselves. I know traditionally botanic gardens have been more like a museum where we stand back and we admire from a distance. Um, I'm really interested in changing that narrative and utilising that and immersing people, myself included, into the to the landscape, um, and and get people in that headspace about thinking about plants more than just that picturesque backdrop that we've all come to love, and and really look at how people and community connect with plants. Um, that's it, and yeah, I want people to look at how plants grow, but also how to grow the plants. I suppose that's that's a big key message. I find uh, coming back into the botanic world, it, it, I feel like a little piece of a puzzle again, and this larger uh, group of organisations, whether they're volunteers, state, council, um, funded, coming together to try and express all that we can do to conserve plants. So conservation is a huge one, but also how we can just really engage with our communities um, about the plants. And, and I think that's the fun part. I think how much diversity can a botanic gardens have 
um, is a really interesting question that, that I keep asking myself. Um, in terms of plant collections, uh, here at the um, Geelong Botanic Gardens, historically, it's been our, we've been able to put our plant collections into three categories. And I'll just bring up um, a map. Yeah, I don't know which, I'm just going to share the screen of um, for everyone that's not familiar with the Geelong Botanic Gardens. So three categories that we've traditionally put our collections under, um, and that has been through um, amenity, horticulture and, and research. So this is a, a picture of our existing botanic gardens, which goes through three centuries. So we've got a 20, a 19th century garden, a 20th century garden, and the 21st century garden. Um, yeah, so amenity, horticultural and research. And I think throughout the human history, the gifting and trading of plants has, has always been a way for people to connect. And that rings true to me as well, being back in this position. Uh, the first curator here at Geelong, Daniel Bunce, he had a vision of the garden to be a centre for plant introduction, acclimatisation and research, but also trial plantings of exotic and native species. And that was 172 years ago. So I, I, I feel that still rings true now. And that's something that I, I really resonate with, something that can span so long in terms of years. We can actually still grasp that and use that as our basis for, for why we're here. Um, and all the curators that have come before me have also had a real involvement with plant sharing. We're in a really good spot here in Geelong. Um, our climate allows us to grow a wide variety of plants. So connecting those plants to people is, is absolutely number one on our agenda with our collection management plan. Um, so meeting and knowing plants is, is what we really want to do here. Um, so amenity, horticulture and research. Um, so the Geelong Botanic Gardens as an institution is something that we need to look at and determine how we, how we deliver that and how the design, how we can design a better system to get people interested in the gardens for whatever reason that they need to be. Um, we, we're slowly starting a journey with the staff here to look at our collection, collection management system. Um, we need to figure out again, what's working and what's not working. And, and it comes in two parts. The way I view collection management is, is about the plants, absolutely, primarily, but it's also about the people. So the plants is that technical process. Um, it's about information gathering. It's about data. It's about how we share that data. But the other, the other, re, or the other aspect I find with, with plant collection is more around the people side of it. We, we need just as much a, a focus on what people we have here to make those plant collections work. So it's for me, it's a balance. It's a balance of how we showcase our plants and how we tell our stories about our plants. But it's also about our people and our people that work here and volunteer here and how we engage those people to be part of the plant collections. Um, we're really fortunate to um, have some really solid strategies here at City of Greater Geelong. We've got a great environmental strategy. Um, we've got a stability framework strategy. We've got climate change response strategy. Working with all the different departments within city allows us to have this unique resource right at our fingertips. And it's certainly something that we don't have to go alone with. And that doesn't even take into account all the external support stakeholders that, that will also come on board and will utilize their help. Um, the way we go about our collections management, that's that's where the, the grit comes in. That, that's what we're starting to establish now. We need to go out to our community. We need to go out to our residents. We need to ask those questions and, and gather that feedback. And if there's no feedback, maybe we look at what we're doing is, is right and people aren't too concerned. I'm more interested in that, the feedback where people are asking questions about why are we here? What do we do? How do we engage? community, how do we engage Indigenous communities, how we engage communities that aren't the green thumb. I think we call them um, numb thumbs now, that people that just, either they're not they're not disliking plants 
just something that they've never never had an inclination to be a part of. And that's something that that rings true with me. My my family is quite numb in their thumbs. Um and I'm always talking about plants and slowly I'm getting to them. So we we want to we want to use this feedback that we're we're trying to gather in data sets to shape the future and the vision of the Geelong Botanic Gardens. And that that will help broaden our scope and and the purpose um, to reflect on this region's 60,000 plus year living culture um, with the First Nations people. Um, so stakeholder engagement, staff engagement, volunteer engagement, community engagement. I, I think there's a lot of resources out there that will help us with our plant collection. And it's a great journey to go on and it's going to take patience and it's going to take time. The people aspect is what, what I'm really interested in at the moment. And and how does what does that success look like at the end? I think that's something we'll have to workshop monthly and on a regular basis to, to make sure that the successes are, are for us as, as work is here, but also for, for people that come in to enjoy the gardens in any way, shape or form. Um, so that's that's pretty much the spiel of Geelong at the moment. I do apologise, I didn't have a um, a PowerPoint presentation to to show you. Um, I was more or less just having a a real deep think about what it is for for me as as a curator here and and the staff. And it's just it's a slow journey um, and a little bit of patience. We're all pretty new in our positions here, and we're all getting to know each other. So it's it's a really positive workspace at the moment, which I hope continues. So that's good. That's all I have to say at the moment. Thanks everyone um, for coming. Has it has um, anyone got any questions for Kelly? You can just raise your hand or maybe pop them in the chat. I'll just have a quick look. Hi Sheree, it's Amelia here. I had a question for yeah. for both Kelly and Peter. I hope I hope I wasn't um, missing something. I was interested in whether um, Cook Town or Geelong have friends groups. And if not, are there particular groups you find in the community that are really engaged and lobbying you for, for particular aspects um, to develop at the gardens or, or to maintain? Thanks. Peter, did you want to go first? Or I'm happy to answer that. Uh, I can go first because mine's probably going to be briefer than yours. <laughs> um, we don't have a friends group. And I think uh, one of the issues that Cooktown does struggle with is volunteering, full stop. Um, it's actually hard to even get volunteers for the SES in a, an area that's prone to disaster. So um, it is something I want to work on, but it's, it is challenging to set that up. Um, and probably through the Bureau of Scarf, Johnson Association is probably the logical connection for that. Uh, apart from that, and I didn't mention this because I was trying to keep the time, is that we've actually had some um, encouraging um, in collaboration with natural resource management agencies. So South Cape Catchment, Cape York, NRM. Um, they've borrowed our ant plants a few times for forks and things like that. So um, there's there's potential to work with them um, you know, on some projects. Um, we do get local um, Local ranges from some of the Aboriginal corporations popping in, sometimes just out of the blue. I'm looking for this plant. Um, can you tell me something about it? We have offered to support any revegetation work that might be done where they might not have the nursery resources or um, there might be plants that are tricky to grow. But you know, our nursery production is pretty poor too, so there's only so much we can do for a small area. But look, I think, yeah, I think. Um, I'm, I suppose I'm keen to, to develop those connections because we can actually be a lot more effective if we work in collaborative with these bigger agencies who often have money to throw at things too. And, you know, we've got a tiny budget. So we, if we work with somebody, um, you know, at some point there's going to need to be some money to, to make some of this happen. But um, that's, that's basically the extent of our work. So I'll shut up now and get out.
Thanks, Amelia. Yes, we have an amazing uh, friends group here and very active in all spaces of the gardens. What I've found in my short time here is the amount of other volunteer groups that are keen to utilise the space here at Geelong um, in all different facets. Uh, the outreach is what I'm really getting my teeth and my head around, sinking my teeth in, sorry. Um, there are so many groups. We're very fortunate to have a large area in Geelong um, with all different um, diversity of people and diversity of um, little areas, what are they, uh, little suburbs, um, found that there's a, a huge interest in all of all of the volunteer groups uh, associated with plants and, and ranging from natural resource areas to low socioeconomic areas to therapy. So I find that this area is is great for, for plant people and, and plant nerds like myself. It just adds that real layering of diversity, which I think is, it makes me smile anyway. So, yeah, we're very fortunate in Geelong, very fortunate. Thank you. That's really interesting, both gardens. Ta. Is there any more questions for Peter or Kelly? I can't see everyone, but hopefully I haven't missed anyone. Um, you can always email anyway if you have any more questions and I can pass them on to um, Peter and Kelly for you. Um, I just wanted to thank everyone for um, for coming along today. It was um, great. We've had great numbers and, um, yeah, it's been really good having everyone show up. So hopefully we can keep it going throughout the year. Um, and I'll send out um, the recording hopefully soon. So if you um, know of anyone who wants to, who missed out or wants to catch up, then um, pass the link on, please. So yeah, thanks very much for attending.